Good morning and welcome to the Deanery Garden on this morning of Sunday the 13th of March as we come to say our morning prayers. Welcome wherever you are in the world. Of course our eyes and our hearts and our minds are fixed on the city of Kiev this morning where the citizens are watching and waiting for the next move to be made against them. And uh, we ourselves were intending to film in, in the front of the deanery this morning. It's a windy morning and that's not what's caused us to move around here, but we are also having later in the day at lunchtime and uh, a bit before that, groups of our old pupils from our King's School coming back for what's called a legacy lunch. And they'll be given tours around the school to see how it's developed. I'm saying all this because uh, that means that our front forecourt is filled with their cars so that they've got ample parking, but at the same time because our new events manager, Julia Campbell, and she's not been with us long, but would have been organising all this today, we're not expecting to see her today because all her family are in Mariupol, in Ukraine, and you know that that seaside city has been really bombed to extinction. And Julia hasn't heard from any member of her family now for 11 days. And she was interviewed this morning on national news. This morning, and I do appreciate your time, but this must be a really, really difficult time for you. Just, just, just tell us, when, when was the last time you spoke to your family in Mariupol? Good morning, thank you for having me. Um, today marks 11 days, and I haven't had any contact with anyone my family. So you, which, which members of your family are, are, are still in the city at the moment? So my mum um, is there in Mariupol, um, my aunt, my uncles, my cousins, my nieces, um, about 20 members of my family. Um, they're all there. My um, brother-in-law and um, lots of my friends that I used to go to school with and half of my life is there so a lot, a lot of my friends and family. We understand, of course, that the communications can often be difficult uh, into Ukraine at the moment, um, particularly cellular communications. But at, at the same time, you must have real fears for their safety right now, given the, the, the level of the, the, the Russian onslaught. Uh, watching, watching everything that is happening, seeing the videos and the footage, it, it, it's still it's difficult to imagine that this is what they're having to live through every single day of their life, 24 hours a day. Um, the shelling does not stop. Um, it, it is roughly from 6 in the morning to 6 in the evening, and then most of the night as well. So people do not get a break to, to, during the day to go and seek any food, any water. And also they, they can't get any rest at night because the shelling is relentless. Um, and it, it is just absolutely unimaginable how people can live in those conditions for this long without any outside help, without any supplies being delivered without any water or medication entering the city for over 13 days now whatever they're eating whatever they're drinking now is what they had left um it is minus seven at night um they have no heating they have no water they have no electricity and they are collecting snow outside um for drinking well we hear from from president zelensky that that the humanitarian corridors will be used later today to try and get aid into the city. At the same time, there's not much of the city that remains, is there? I was just looking at those pictures there um, of, of, of the city, basically. You know, large swathes of it have now been placed to the ground. T tell me a little bit about Mariupol, the, the city that it was before the Russians came. <clears throat> um, it, it was the most beautiful place. Um, um, so, so much effort has been put into restoring it, rebuilding it after the situation um, in 2014. And um, it, it is a beautiful seaside city um, with so much gorgeous infrastructure. There's, it's a multinational community with lots of universities. Um, you know, it, it, it was thriving. It was just at the best point of, of its existence, I think, before this started. We have a huge Greek community. You know, there is um, uh, about, at this point, there is about 100 people um, have been trapped uh, in the Mariupol um, and they are Turkish citizens and they're seeking shelter in one of the mosques in, uh, in Mariupol. Um, so the, the, 
you know, it, it was a very, very beautiful city, but now it has been completely wiped out and there is really not much left. And, you know, watching my, my school being bombed and the university that I went to, it, it just, it, I cannot comprehend that still. Given what you are seeing, and, and of course, given the, the lack of contact that you've had with so many members of your family and, and indeed your friends, I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts are of Vladimir Putin and indeed the, the Russian people right now. Oh, I don't know where to begin. Uh, the, the, there isn't a, a little glimpse of humanity left. Uh, I, I cannot believe that one person can totally destroy a country and kill civilians at such a large scale because what he's doing at the moment is is wiping away all ukrainians whether he wants to have ukraine without any ukrainians in it that's that's what i'm seeing um as you probably have heard um you know uh, president zelensky has announced that um over 1300 troops have died since the beginning of the war however mariupol it itself has lost nearly 1500 people if you think about the numbers they're all civilians 1,500 civilians have been killed in the last 14 days. And Mariupol is, is just fighting its own battle because nobody's helping. The humanitarian corridors are not working. Um, humanitarian aid is not coming in. Um, there was an attempt, six or seventh attempt yesterday, I lost count, um, where the humanitarian aid was due to arrive from Zaporizhia. And um, again, ceasefire has not happened. Um, it has not been abided uh, by the Russian troops, and therefore they, they, they are in between Mariupol at the moment, they are on the border of Mariupol. But this time, I think in a desperate plight to help, they um, they have been accompanied by the members of the church, and there is uh, one member of the uh, church community is in each of the vehicles, just to, to see if that might help. Um, but the, to be honest, at this stage, I don't believe that anything will stop Putin. Um, you know, he's he's bombing schools, he's bombing hospitals, he's bombing maternity wards, he's bombing churches. All the churches in Ukraine have now been mainly, most of them have been destroyed, and this is where people are seeking shelter because a lot of the homes have been destroyed. People are living in these conditions in weather. As I said, it's snowing. It's about minus seven every day, and they, they there are no windows left. Um, the homes are barely standing. People are cooking outside. And, and you know that that seaside city has been really bombed to extinction. And Julia hasn't heard from any member of her family now for 11 days. And she was interviewed this morning on national news and was saying that what a beautiful city that was. It was already damaged by the invasion of Crimea, but was being restored most beautifully. And how all her memories are there and so many friends. So that gives us a, a human contact right into that uh, devastated city where so many have died and uh, so much uh, damage to the city itself has been done. And <clears throat> these personal links bring the whole thing home to us. The only thing that we can do is say our prayers. So we're praying for Julia this morning, and we shall do so again with the school and in the school service tonight, which will happen at 7.30 tonight in the cathedral. But meanwhile, at the legacy lunch, I'll be able to say a prayer with all of them too for Julia as a sign of all that is going on in Ukraine as the world watches and waits. And all our prayers are for the citizens of the whole of Ukraine, but especially this morning, the city of Kiev. So let's think about that in our reflection, but let's begin to say our prayers on this morning, this lovely sunny Sunday morning here, with a blustery wind. Bring your own intentions and your prayers. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. Hear our voice, O Lord, according to your faithful love. According to your judgment, give us life. Blessed are you, God of compassion and mercy. To you be praise and glory forever. In the darkness of our sin, your light breaks forth like the dawn, and your healing springs up for deliverance. As we rejoice in the gift of your saving help, sustain us with your bountiful spirit, and open our lips to sing your praise. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. 
The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. And as we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and for ever. Amen. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 68. It's a long one, so we shall read, as we normally do, just a section of it. Let God arise, and let his enemies be scattered. Let those that hate him flee before him. As the smoke vanishes, so may they vanish away. As wax melts at the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. But let the righteous be glad and rejoice before, Lord, before God. Let them make merry with gladness. Sing to God. Sing praises to his name. Exalt him who rides on the clouds. The Lord is his name. Rejoice before him. Father of the fatherless, defender of widows, God in his holy habitation. God gives the solitary a home and brings forth prisoners to songs of welcome. Blessed be the Lord, who bears our burdens day by day, for God is our salvation. God is for us the God of our salvation. God is the Lord, who can deliver from death Sing to God, you kingdoms of the earth. Make music in praise of the Lord. He rides on the ancient heaven of heavens and sends forth his voice, a mighty voice. Ascribe power to God, whose splendor is over Israel, whose power is above the clouds. How terrible is God in his holy sanctuary, the God of Israel who gives power and strength to all his people. Blessed be God. Sunday morning, so we have a special lesson. We leave the Gospel of St. John, and both here and at the Cathedral Eucharist, at which I'm praying in about uh, an hour or so's time, um, the uh, lesson is from St. Luke. And both are similar, but they're in different parts of St. Luke's Gospel. The one at the Eucharist that I shall preach on is from St. Luke chapter 13, starting at verse 31. This one is in a different part of St. Luke. It's St. Luke 19, and we're coming to the point where Jesus is crossing the Mount of Olives before he enters Jerusalem. And I'm going to read uh, from verse 37 of chapter 19 of St. Luke's Gospel. We read to, the, um, to verse 45. As Jesus was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. But some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he drew near and saw the city of Jerusalem, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade round you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple. 
on this occasion and in Luke 13, Jesus laments over the city of Jerusalem. Here he is standing on the Mount of Olives, looking down at that beautiful sight which lay below him. There in all its glory stood the temple, probably in the morning sunshine, ablaze with the golden insets of the vine which was set into its stones. It's still a wonderful sight if you look at Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives and you look across the Garden of Gethsemane and see the city beyond. But Jesus, on this occasion, when he crosses the mountain and pauses, weeps over the city. I think there are only two occasions when Jesus weeps in the Gospels. And one of them is, of course, at the tomb of Lazarus. And the people, this is in St. John's Gospel, John 11, um, the people say, see how he loved him. And here, the weeping is for the city. Our hearts ache, and so many situations cause us to weep, not only just for the city of Kiev, but all the cities and communities of Ukraine this morning, at this time of watching and waiting. But here is around Jesus, the song of his disciples. And they're singing, and they'd be used to it, the last of the pilgrim songs, which was traditional to sing as a pilgrim as you came to Jerusalem. And the last was Psalm 118. And in that, you find the sentence, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And here is a, a, a welcome song being sung at the end of a journey. And as they cross the mountain, one thinks of Jesus stopping. There is at that point now a church which is set there looking across at Jerusalem. And the uh, church is called Dominus Flavit, the Lord wept. And I think it's one of the most beautiful places to worship in, and certainly for a priest to celebrate the communion, because you're looking down means you have to face east, as used to be traditional, with your back to the people. But no one would deny you that pleasure, because it is a pleasure and a privilege to stand there and to celebrate communion, looking right out on that scene of the city of Jerusalem today, just as the Lord looked down on the city and wept over it. He wept for a very different reason from our tears for Kiev. He wept because he had found such violence in the city already, and he prophesies in this lesson where that violence will lead. For violence breeds violence. And this sense of him wanting to give the good gifts of God in peace and the gifts of the Spirit in love and in faith and in hope to the people finding there many, many amongst the people, rather like the, the Greeks we've thought of recently, who have uh, been asking to see Jesus, and Philip and Andrew made sure they did. But there are those, though, who, that those there who, who challenge him and are violent towards him. And already there are the Pharisees standing around saying, cause your disciples to be quiet. And Jesus answers with that sentence, which we thought about recently. Uh, if they were silent, the very stones would cry out. But he weeps over the city. 
and that sense of sadness is something that for very different reasons we are feeling this morning and I'm sure that often when we're looking at the news bulletins our tears flow fairly freely because of all that we're seeing it becomes a, a, a tragedy unfolding and we still can't really believe that all this is happening we look at the pictures of that beautiful city of Kiev with all its holy places for in truth it was the way in which Christianity was given to the whole of, of Russia it's the, 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 the mother of all but think of the city of Jerusalem as Jesus knew it it was destined in the year AD 70 to be totally destroyed as far as the imperial armies of Rome led by the generalship of, of Titus who would become emperor himself one day and they made absolutely sure that they destroyed and burned everything they could thousands of the citizens were slaughtered thousands taken into slavery and all the precious objects of the temple were taken back to Rome in triumph and the arch of Titus with the emblems of the temple is of course still there able to be seen in the city of Rome itself all of that happened and Jesus's prophecy given in St Luke of all the siege works and barricades and everything else that would go into the siege of Jerusalem in in the year 70 has caused scholars to haggle over the fact of had that already happened when Luke wrote or was it still yet to come and the answer is it's, it's difficult to prove it one way or the other but it doesn't matter because what Jesus is saying is that what should have been a house of prayer has become like a den of thieves and it's become greedy for other things than the gifts of God and he's longing to give it an extra uh, um, amount of the evangel to, 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 to go and give the good news and the qualities of the Spirit there. So it takes us, all of those things takes us, take us to the, the, the sense of where we are this morning and it's hard to use words to describe it. I've spent <coughs> half an hour this morning already on the telephone to the ambassador for Hungary of the Sovereign Order of Malta. We've talked about that before and we've shown what wonderful work the Order of Malta, the sister order of the Order of St John, which runs St John's Ambulance here, and is an order of chivalry like the Order of Malta, but engaged in huge amounts of charitable work. And the Order of Malta has many, many stations of charitable work on the borders and actually inside Ukraine itself. And the ambassador that I was talking to, uh, and uh, his name is Imre Ugron, he's a Hungarian, and he, last night, when I first spoke to him, on the telephone said let's talk in the morning I'm just driving back from the city of Lviv back home to Hungary and that journey took hours and hours but he had been on a visit to the uh, headquarters and the charitable sites of the Ukrainian part of the order which is still functioning in relief terms and he'd gone to the city of Lviv uh, and uh, he described to me the journey there and what he saw along the way and described to me also what he found in the city itself and what has stuck in my mind from that conversation it was a long conversation and stuck in my mind was the chaos that he found at the railway station in Lviv anyone can travel free to the border and if they cross the border into Hungary they can travel free 
to wherever they want to go on the railway if they're a Ukrainian citizen. But of course, the, the railway station, surrounded by thousands of people, desperately saying goodbye to each other, desperately trying to find a, a, a train which would take them to one of the borders, to Hungary, to Slovakia, to Poland, to Moldova, all those places. And here the ambassador was, was actually describing it to me. And I felt, what a brave journey. He said, my wife, who was back in Hungary, was uh, really terrified. She said, I shouldn't make the journey, but I felt I had to go and visit our relief stations to see, first of all, to impart good morale, but at the same time to see how they were at this time and whether relief was getting through. And the answer, of course, is that in some places it is. And certainly on the border stations, there is instant on both sides because the Order of St. John is working both on the Hungarian side and the Slovakian side and also in Ukraine itself and at the border um, the, the uh, people coming are helped on the Ukrainian side to fill in where they want to go to put down their names to say what family they have in different parts of Europe, where they would want to be. And all that is done for them by the volunteers of the Order of Malta, so that when they then cross the border and the uh, volunteers of the Order of Malta meet them on the other side, not from the Ukrainian branch of the order, but from the Hungarian or the, the Slovakian uh, branch, when they meet them there, then no papers have to be filled in. They simply hand over, no translations needed, they hand over what has been written out for them so that they can hand that on. And then there is transport arranged. First of all, of course, there's relief and if uh, an instant accommodation or medical help is needed, that is given. I can't say how brave these people are being. And also they're working all the hours that the Lord gives them <clears throat> in order to do that. And, and certainly this man himself, the ambassador, had in a, a, a car travelling through all of that, had seen both terrible things and also things which gave him great hope. He'd seen in the middle of the city of Lviv that all things were running almost normally. There was still meat in the meat market and there were still vegetables there and supplies seemed to be getting through but at the same time of course that city is beginning to pack up its treasures as we did here in the, uh, be at the beginning of the uh, Second World War. And my predecessor, who was known as the Red Dean, uh, Hewlett Johnson, uh, was laughed at for taking out the stained glass and, and, and placing it in the safety under earth and things in the crypt because it was felt that, that Canterbury would never be touched by uh, uh, any kind of bombardment. And of course it was, in a huge way, uh, at the Baidika raids of 1942. So here is Lviv beginning to pack up, it's a World Heritage Site, as we are, pack up treasures, but at the same time to look after its people. And on the outskirts are young men, and maybe some of you have seen the BBC's uh, little um, film that it made yesterday of students, and uh, two of them uh, who were students, one an economist, one a biologist, one aged 19, one aged 18, who'd just been volunteers and now are in military uniforms and you felt um, that their passion for their country, but it made you weep to hear them say, well of course we're, we're afraid, anyone would be afraid, because it's natural for a human being to, to fear death but some things are more important than that. And those two young men were a, a sign of all those volunteering. But of course, they're the ones who are left and others have been sent to safety and mothers and children are being received. And the Order of Malta, again, uh, their uh, executive, uh, their chief executive here, Philippa Leslie, is in constant touch with us and telling us of the work in Beragovo, in Tarpa, in Gior, in Budapest itself. I'm talking Hungary because we've been in touch with the Hungarian ambassador for the Order of Malta. And the Pope's representative to that order, Cardinal Michael Cerny, last week visited all the places that he possibly could in order to give something of a sense of, um, of 
encouragement from the outside world. All those things are going on and at the same time the headquarters of the order have uh, the accommodation database with the offers of accommodation all the time coming in. Um, this morning 4,422 vacancies coming in. Volunteers saying that they will want to help and, and going to the borders and going where the order places them and donors also. And there's an opportunity for you, we'll put the link on again, to be able to contribute to the work of the Sovereign Order of Malta and particularly their relief arm in Ukraine itself at this time, this urgent time when we're thinking of the cities that we would weep over. If I go through the, the list of the places which uh, the Order of Malta was giving us this morning inside Ukraine, Beregovo and Tarpa and Gior, um, those places were having projects, beautiful things, like a children's play bus in Beregovo. And that detail had been given to us by Philippa, so I asked the ambassador about it and he said, well, I'm afraid um, we can't now do anything with that kind of activity there because all our volunteers, if they're, they're young enough and they're men, are being called off to um, be part of what the students are doing to fight for their country and mothers and children are being advised to make their way to, to safety. So many of the wonderful charitable things that are going on have been completely taken over by the need to contribute money in order that food and medicine and health and help can be supplied. And so uh, lots of projects of course will start up again when peace returns but at the moment everything is geared to the help of refugees and the way in which the young volunteers are having to face uh, the threat of violence towards them because they're now ready with the sandbags and the border that the, the 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 way in which the roads are guarded and the ambassador said as he drove back through so many villages seemed to be either deserted or the people had locked themselves in if they were still there but the old and the very poor and those who are uh, solitary um, are still there and he found one place where a schoolroom was just filled with people asleep on the floor and there were very few resources. He's now put the teams in touch with that but there, may be, there must be many places like that. Think of your, your own um, schoolrooms, your own village schools and things of that sort and think, think how in a peaceful time they'd be full of happy children learning and now it's quite different and so many of the schools which have had to close and emptied and the mothers and children have gone and the husbands and the young men are, are, are there ready to fight for their country but at the same time the, 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 the schools are, are, are filled with people who've sought shelter there on the way. Uh, there's so much to say but we're, we're talking about uh, ways in which you can help and it's mostly by sending donations to places where you know that's going to be used in Ukraine itself and at the places where welcome is being given on the borders. So all of those things will supply the details of how to get in touch in that way. Let's keep thinking that with the people like Julia Campbell and all her family uh, in Mariupol and uh, the, the, the two young students, everything is a personal story and that's how the, the good news of the gospel is, is translated. Everyone is, is given a particular quality of life where their creative gifts can be used. Yesterday we were looking at violinists playing and surrounding a young man in a shelter uh, as he was playing as a Ukrainian song which someone had the imagination to set up with famous violinists from all over the world uh, a Zoom which became a kaleidoscope of violinists growing and growing and growing, playing together the Ukrainian song which was being played by the young violinists there.
there, who was a young man just like the two students, the economist and the, the um, biologist who had given up their books to go to war. And uh, so, um, <laughs> I don't know what Leo's eaten, but it's something that's not good for him. Um, so let's then just think of, of that situation and the way that Jesus wept over the city, the city itself of Jerusalem, and longed for its welfare and peace. And for very different reasons, we weep this morning in our prayers over the cities of Ukraine and long for their peace. Well, I think that all we can do on a morning like this is to pray. And we do pray, both here in the garden, across the world, and also um, we pray in the cathedral in our services. I shall pray with our school. And the same kind of stories will be told, but each will have seen different images because we now live in a world where images can pass quickly across. But at the same time, I felt privileged to be speaking to uh, the ambassador for the uh, Order of Malta, who had just been, in the last 24 hours, going from place to place to place and finding out what was needed where, encouraging the teams, finding where more volunteers were needed, arranging the shifts so that they don't absolutely wear themselves out completely and use all their human resources which need to be given at the moment to one another. All of these things become crucially important. We're going to say our prayers in a moment, but I wanted to mention the music of a Hungarian pianist, composer and singer who's called Matthias Baxo. We've actually played some of his music before. It's very beautiful music, but at the moment she's very keen that we should use his music. And again, we've been in touch with him. And uh, I think we shall use his music from time to time, and Fletcher will put on what the music is. One of his pieces is called Prayer, and he wrote it so that it could be played as a, a background to the Our Father in whatever language that's being said. It comes from something called Fragments from Everyday Life. And at the same time, he's written a piece called Sunday Morning. Well, Sunday Morning, when he was writing this piece, was giving thanks for the fact that Sunday was a day of rest and, and didn't mean getting up for work and all of that. Well, of course, it's anything but that now. For Ukraine, it's a day of waiting. And for many, it's a day of, of really hard work for far too many hours because they are dealing with jobs that are too big for them and too dangerous. And at the same time, he has written a, a lovely piece called Raindrops, which simply speaks of the, the, the glory of God's creation, refreshing the earth. All these things are precious, but at the moment we give thanks for the quality of uh, Matthias Baxo, the Hungarian musician, and everything that he writes. We're going to pray this morning. Let me find our list. We're going to pray for the Anglican Church of Melanesia in the South Pacific. And uh, we've um, many contacts with that, which the uh, Brotherhood of, of Melanesia, of young men and women, giving part of their life to uh, a, a, a spiritual community uh, rather like a, a, someone going into the army for a couple of years and training. This is a different kind of thing. The, the Melanesian Brotherhood we pray for today. They were important to us, especially at the time of the last Lambeth Conference, when uh, seven of them had been um, martyred and they brought an icon which is now hanging in our chapel of modern martyrs. So we give thanks for the faith of the Church of Melanesia. But at the same time, uh, we are praying for our own diocese and in a general prayer this morning and for Justin, our Archbishop, for Rose, Bishop of Dover and for Emma, Bishop at Lambeth. And 
you will have many images in your minds and hearts as we watch and wait and weep over those cities waiting to see what their fate will be and the consciousness of our prayers this is what the ambassador said this morning the consciousness of our prayers of this garden congregation is more precious than you can possibly know but let that consciousness also move you to to action as well here is the collect for today the second Sunday of Lent Almighty God you show to those who are in error the light of your truth that they may return to the way of righteousness grant to all those who are admitted into the fellowship of Christ's religion that they may reject those things that are contrary to their profession and follow all such things as are agreeable to the same through our Lord Jesus Christ Amen and the colic for Lent itself Almighty and everlasting God you hate nothing that you have made and forgive the sins of all those who are penitent create and make in us new and contrite hearts that we worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness may receive from you the God of all mercy perfect remission and forgiveness through Jesus Christ our Lord Amen so let us then join together in our different ways and different languages in the prayer our Saviour taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. A moment now for your own reflections on this morning.
during your reflection you've been looking at um, wonderful pictures of glass by the Hungarian Bosanyi, who came here as a refugee in the years of the Second World War to escape from uh, persecution there in Hungary and then made his life in the United States later but created glass of the uh, prisoner being called to the light in release and also of the, the, the children of, of, of different nations. So we give thanks for that work of the Hungarian Bassani. There's some also in the Cathedral Church at Washington, uh, the National Cathedral there. At the same time, we have a, a very strong link indeed with Hungary, with Estegom, because the Archbishop of Estegom had been with Beckett at the Sorbonne and one of the original relics of Beckett was given to Estegom to, to right at the beginning, to take back to Estegom. It's always been there. It was a sign of the Christian life of Hungary during the years of the Soviet occupation. But at the same time, when that was over, we had a huge pilgrimage come from Estegom, uh, led by their ambassador here who became a friend and uh, we I remember a, a wonderful party on the lawn here as well as services in the cathedral they brought the relic as a sign of pilgrimage across and then took it back to Estegom so there's that strong link between Canterbury and uh, the shrine at Estegom as well. Christ give you grace to grow in holiness to deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you, upon those whom you would pray for and those whom you love today and always. Amen. May God bless your Sunday and make it a day of um, enrichment uh, spiritually and in all sorts of other ways um, as, as far as he is able and you are able to accept that today.